Hello and welcome to uh, the conference board. I'm uh, Chris Gentle and I'm delighted you can join us here today uh, for our piece here on uh, digital finance, the pivot point. Uh, absolutely delighted you can join us and uh, hopefully over the next hour we'll answer some of those really big questions about how do you apply digital in the finance function. Uh, before we can do that, as we know before the plane takes off, there's just a couple of housekeeping matters that uh, we need to, to deal with. So uh, participating in this uh, webcast, if you haven't before, let me just uh, share with you uh, four or five points which are important. Uh, the first of which is that uh, we hope that this is a very much an interactive uh, session. Um, so if there are questions, uh, please do ask them uh, and put them in the chat box there. We'll be monitoring those and uh, bring them up and uh, ask either myself or my uh, co-presenter uh, about those questions as we go along. So I do encourage you uh, to put those into the uh, chat box. Uh, you can see there's an opportunity here to download the uh, presentation. So uh, for both the presentations, if you'd like to do that, that is available uh, as well. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, some of the slides have a lot of detail on them. Um, so uh, one of the things that you can do is you, you can switch between views. So if you want to look just at the PowerPoint, that's, that's possible to really absorb some of the detail that's been talked about and then flip back to the video as well. So that's an, an option that we, we have for you there. Uh, as ever with uh, these kind of presentations, we'd love to hear what uh, you think about the webcast, uh, how you think the content has gone and the presentation. So there'll be a short kind of feedback at the end of what we're doing. Again, could I encourage you to, uh, to, to do that? Uh, and uh, we'll share, uh, potentially you can share this with your colleagues if you find it particularly useful. Again, there's a, a record function that's happening here. So you'll be able to share this uh, presentation, this webcast uh, with uh, your uh, colleagues. So that's the housekeeping. Just a little point uh, if you're uh, looking at CPE uh, here in terms of earning credits, uh, which is, is a good thing. Just a couple of things to make sure that you can get those credits. Uh, the first is actually just making sure your name and address is in there. Uh, and then secondly, that there will be pop-ups that come during uh, the webcast. It's important that you click on those in order to earn the credits. Those go throughout uh, the webcast. So it's important that uh, you do that uh, in order to kind of get the full accreditation uh, for this session. Um, so. Uh, those are the housekeeping matters. Now we can uh, get on with the uh, real business of the webcast today. Uh, and I'm delighted uh, today to uh, introduce uh, my co-presenter, Mr. Thomas Martin from uh, ABB. Uh, Thomas, would you like to just uh, briefly introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, Chris, and welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Thomas Martin, and I'm the Group Manager of Purchase to Pay at ABB GBS Finance. And as such, uh, I was had the pleasure to introduce uh, RPA in uh, ABB. Thank you, Thomas. And uh, we'll be returning to you very shortly in terms of uh, uh, talking about some of the issues around digital finance and the real application of those uh, in terms of RPAs uh, in particular. Uh, I myself, uh, Chris Gentle uh, at the uh, conference board, the Insights uh, Director, uh, delighted you're here today uh, to talk about the topic in hand, which is we call pivot points uh, and uh, looking at the application of digital in the finance function. Now, uh, every day we read the papers, the robots are coming. We read these headlines again and again. And uh, what they say is that basically lots of jobs will be wiped out uh, from uh, the application of digital technologies across business. Uh, the march of those androids is onwards uh, and we'll all be losing our jobs within a few years. Now, we know that this reality is, is not true, uh, but the kind of question is exactly how do you use uh, digital and how do you make the most of it, particularly in terms of finance? Uh, and so that much more nuanced uh, kind of uh, uh, picture is something that we want to deal with today. And we want to look at uh, finance in particular. Uh, digital transformation is obviously sweeping away uh, lots of things within business and really changing. In fact, last year uh, was the first time that corporates uh, spent more on uh, technology uh, around a trillion dollars uh, than the whole of Silicon Valley put together. So we can see that business is really taking digital seriously now. Uh, and the kind of question we want to address is basically, how do you do that within the finance function? What are the secrets 
uh, they need to look at and what are some of the best practices to really kind of make this happen. And so we chose the title uh, Pivot Points uh, as a way of actually kind of doing this. Uh, and uh, that's what we want to uh, start with here is basically how is finance really making that switch? Uh, finance has, in the past has really looked at uh, how do we actually kind of deal with a lot of transactional issues about with uh, ERP systems, with actually recording uh, what's happened in the past and providing that as a, a picture of uh, to make uh, future decisions. And what we see at this pivot point is actually a switch. Finance is actually going to be much more around looking at the future, about how it does it, do you create the future, how do you forecast more accurately around working capital uh, and uh, those kind of areas, uh, and how uh, can finance become a true, not even a business partner, but a commercial partner. A number of times I've heard uh, CEOs uh, say uh, to me that they'd like finance and finance controllers to be playing a much bigger role, maybe spending 80% of their time uh, working with them taking commercial decisions rather than spending time on the spreadsheets and the ERP. So that's the, uh, the, the challenge that's there and that's what we want to focus on. Not the if, but the how do we do that. So uh, if we take uh, the first slide here, uh, I thought we'd just start with actually looking at how do we define uh, digital technologies as we can see here what I call the big six uh, and um, those are uh, pretty useful in terms of actually uh, getting a coherent understanding across your teams. Uh, lots of people will be looking at uh, uh, different finance um, processes that could be uh, uh, adapted to use digital uh, and uh, the kind of question is, is everybody using the same language, understanding what the technologies are, and actually how uh, your organization might acquire these technologies? So the big six are uh, artificial intelligence, internet of things and big data, uh, blockchain, uh, digital and cloud, uh, material and advanced science, and robotics uh, in terms of actually the factory uh, use of those. Now we've got to tick above the top three. The reason for that is that we uh, see those as the most uh, likely digital technologies to be applied within finance functions. In fact, in many cases, that process has already started. Uh, data analytics being uh, one of those uh, that's been uh, focused on uh, at uh, the moment. So just a final point on these big six. If you haven't had that conversation in your organization yet or within your team, is there an understanding about exactly what digital technologies are uh, within this family of six? Which ones are most likely to be used in your finance function? And how are you going to get hold of those technologies and deploy them is the conversation that you really need to be uh, having with your colleagues if that hasn't happened already. So as we see on the next slide here, what uh, really is uh, interesting is that um, uh, we, uh, as I've already said, that the, the uh, technologies deployed uh, in the finance process are already starting to uh, come about, particularly around uh, big data. So if we uh, look at the technologies deployed, we look at the high deployment down to uh, a lower priority. Uh, what we found at conference board already is that we see, as I've already mentioned, big data already being deployed. So in terms of business intelligence, uh, data analytics, uh, and uh, uh, data lakes, um, previously called data warehouses, where organizations are trying to make the most of data. Not only the data that was within the organization already, uh, so what's been generated uh, from, um, uh, from purchase to pay uh, and various uh, other uh, processes that are there, but also actually uh, secondary data that's coming in both from supply chains within the organization and maybe even without the organization. How do you bring all this uh, data together and then actually start to look at it and understand what it means in order to do that around forecasting, uh, cash flow, and scenario planning, uh, which are all kind of critical and value adding bits of what finance brings. Uh, one example I heard of this was a pharmaceutical company that wasn't managing this process particularly well. They didn't have in place the exact pro formas that were required uh, for that organization. They're all different in different places. 
And as a consequence, uh, their data quality was poor. Uh, they had to go and raise an extra two billion on the markets because that data was so poor. And then it was discovered that, that was a mistake. So these are really significant issues if we don't get the data quality, data analytics uh, right. Now moving on to the next area, and this is something that uh, Thomas is going to talk about in a lot more detail, so I'll just touch on it a little bit here, uh, is really around artificial intelligence. Uh, and what we're looking at here is RPAs, or Robotic Process Automation. Some people know this as machine learning. Essentially what we're looking at here is uh, computers starting to learn um, commodified transactions uh, so that, that once they understand them to do once, that they can work on this process again and again. Uh, one of the advantages clearly of this is an efficiency gain. Uh, so rather than having uh, somebody in the office in the finance team or even in a global business center, a shared service center that works, let's say, between nine and five o'clock, uh, once we have the R RPA robot up and running, it runs 24 hours, 365 days a year. So a fantastic uh, uh, efficiency gain in terms of cost. So I said, uh, so we can see that that can be applied in terms of management reporting or in terms of um, uh, things around transaction processing, uh, purchase to payers are already mentioned. Uh, I'll leave Thomas to talk about that in more detail. And then the third and furthest out priority as we see at the conference board is really around blockchain. Uh, as you see here, uh, DLT, some people call this digital ledger technology. So this is the technology behind uh, uh, Bitcoin, but absolutely shouldn't be confused with that. Uh, this is really kind of using cryptography to start to look at building a blockchain into supply chains, uh, both for authenticity, uh, to make sure that they're more secure, but also to open up uh, boundaries. So for example, in the financial sector now, uh, we've got companies like WeTrade, which is actually uh, an initiative by the banks, which is actually uh, underpinning trade finance. Typically in the past, this took uh, up to 24 days to actually make sure that the paperwork and the finance uh, could, uh, uh, let's say, a, a shipment of soybeans from uh, Buenos Aires and Argentina to, to China would take 24 days to actually do all the paperwork and make sure the transaction happens. Applying the blockchain technology, this can take place within the hour uh, and therefore makes the global trading system much more safe, secure. But the financial data that goes with that is obviously uh, better as well. Uh, it gets rid of the paper. So blockchain is starting to be used. Uh, but it's the furthest down the priority list at the present time, uh, potentially the biggest impact, but uh, furthest away at the present time. So the question uh, then is basically, uh, so how do we within the team, uh, in the finance team, start to put our priorities together to create a vision about how we might use digital uh, in the finance function in the future? And uh, based on our kind of work here at Conference Board, working with Conference Board members, uh, we really kind of brought that down to three areas. Uh, you can see them here. Uh, reduce and automate transactional activity. And again, I think this is Thomas, something that Thomas is going to talk about. I've mentioned some of the things in terms of accounts payable or receivable in some of those areas. But really working on that cost efficiency uh, quality uh, 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 equation to make that happen. So. That's number one in terms of uh, priorities, in terms of the way that people saw this. Uh, second is in terms of uh, how to enhance that business partnering or uh, commercial partnering uh, activities. Uh, so as I mentioned uh, with the example, far too many uh, finance people spending time pulling things off ERP, putting them into spreadsheets, doing some analysis, and then talking to the business. So maybe 80% of the time is spent uh, on that process of trying to get hold of the data and do some of the interpretation. And maybe 20% is actually spent uh, with the business actually making uh, those kind of decisions. In fact, one finance person described this to me, this process, as really kind of running to stand still. And that's uh, not a good sustainable position. Uh, so the quicker they can transition to uh, digital finance, uh, freeing up more time, allowing more time to be spent with the business, Will be a key kind of benefit of doing this. The third and final kind of um, uh, priority that, that was mentioned was also uh, HQ relationships. Now all too often we neglect these by focusing on uh, what's going on not only within finance but maybe just within our team. 
uh, uh, let's say accounts payable, uh, and just think thinking about what needs to get done in that particular area. But one of the things when you uh, kind of helicopter up and zoom up and take a much bigger picture of this is actually similar challenges on digitization are going on with your colleagues elsewhere in the business, whether that's, that's obviously within IT, but also, uh, for example, within HR as well. So it may be worth reaching out to those colleagues and actually understanding what uh, uh, different uh, applications they've done, which uh, uh, roadblocks they've run into uh, around uh, putting digital in place, and looking at how you might get solutions that go across uh, organizations as well. Uh, building those peer networks actually can be very, very kind of useful in terms of actually dealing with digitization. Now, just a couple of slides before I hand over to um, uh, Thomas. Uh, the first is in terms of what's the agenda for change, and if we've set the vision, uh, what do we need to set in terms of kind of priorities of that agenda uh, for moving this forward? Uh, I won't go into all the detail here, but uh, we can see there are five really uh, uh, that we have here uh, defining, you know, what finance is going to do in the future. I mentioned at the beginning about. Uh, focusing much more on commercial decisions uh, should be a vision uh, that should be there, uh, maybe much more cost efficient and efficient. The quality of data might be some things that you put around that. Uh, but one of the things that uh, we notice that is traditional accountants sometimes are struggling with this. And so one of the things we see is finance functions hiring people in with other expertise, not necessarily accounting expertise, numerate, yes, but actually a good understanding maybe of a technology or a different part of the business. Uh, and making uh, uh, finance much more diverse. Efficiency effectiveness are obviously uh, two key benefits of digitization. Uh, and this won't be without its challenges. So as one person said to me, we've had some pretty heated discussions on costs. Uh, so be prepared for those in terms of that some people won't see this as a potentially a good thing, uh, that people would want to say, well, we think that the way that we do things at the present time is good. And as one chief accountant said to me, is I don't want to damage data quality by going into digitization. Um, but we can't hold back uh, the waves on this one. It is going to happen. It's a kind of question of how we do this, not if, if we do this. Uh, so as I mentioned, that data quality po po point. And then the final bit is uh, actually, you know, how do we get much more involved in those business decisions? Uh, somebody here, as you can see, uh, quoted as saying, we have too many prima donnas even in, in, in finance. So uh, actually kind of saying, let's strip this back and look at what we do, how we can help the business. Uh, that's the real kind of driver behind uh, what we're hoping uh, to achieve here. So uh, getting that agenda, agenda for change in place is pretty critical in order to uh, to make sure that this is successful. And the final point I just wanted to, to raise um, is just in terms of actually, so how do we draw the operating model uh, for the future? Uh, and increasingly, we can see here, this is just an example uh, of what we have um, uh, put together here at a very kind of high level. Uh, so you see this uh, next slide here. Uh, what uh, we uh, can see here is that the finance function um, is uh, one where increasingly it needs to focus on those things that are value adding to the business. So uh, thinking here about forecasting, uh, planning, uh, can we enhance the close and make it uh, quicker? How do we uh, uh, improve in terms of adding strategic value and, and uh, that commercial element and making the controlling much more tight in terms of what's happening around the business so that we really know the numbers and really can make decisions? And maybe a couple of uh, centers of excellence which are looking at these new technologies or different particular challenges. We set them up. Uh, they've got a very short lifespan. We put people in that. It gives a new dynamic. Uh, maybe use uh, uh, Scrum thinking or design thinking in order to, uh, to 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 make this a real much more dynamic environment uh, because the status quo is changing. As we can see at the bottom there, uh, draining out some of the transactional things, uh, uh, maybe into a shared service center, other organization to a global business uh, shared services, uh, but actually taking that transactional stuff out maybe even passing some of that on to uh, operational stuff as finance becomes more and more focused on the commercial and the strategic in helping the business win in the marketplace, which is ultimately uh, the thing that uh, finance is hoping to achieve. 
So I just wonder if there are any uh, questions before we hand over to uh, Thomas in terms of what we talked about before in terms of setting that broad canvas about the technology that's uh, uh, really kind of now driving change in finance, bring us to this pivot point uh, and looking at then about how do we kind of identify what our technologies are, what's our vision about what we're hoping to achieve and then how do we organize ourselves uh, to achieve that. Um, any questions that we want to take? Okay, so uh, no questions at the present time. What I will do now is I'll finish my bit. I will now hand over uh, to Thomas uh, Martin from uh, ABB and uh, Thomas will talk about some of now the real example about how ABB have taken uh, digital finance uh, really by the scruff of the neck and, and, and really implemented that uh, there. So Thomas, over to you. All right, thank you, uh, Chris. And um, thanks for having the opportunity to present here. As I said, is a RPA a game changer for your organization? Um, I deliberately put this here out as a big question and I hope uh, to give you the answer throughout this presentation. The agenda looks as follows. First, introduction short intro on ABB and the topic itself, then our journey in RPA, in GBS Finance, process selection criteria or uh, process, the learnings we have done in this uh, couple of years, and then uh, very short on future developments and opportunities, then trying to get the answers uh, responded at least from my point of view or from my experience point of view. Now, first about ABB. Um, very hot of the press, as starting as of yesterday, we have these four divisions going forward, one of them being divested. This is keeping us busy at the moment. One that we are definitely very proud of is the robotics division. Um, as a leading supplier of industrial robots, uh, it was, of course, very important for me as well in the GPS finance area that we are starting to be on the edge or trying not to lose traction on this, and we try to jump on the RPA topic uh, on it maybe relatively early, but it took us also a little bit longer, so um, I think it's it's great, uh, as said. We are preaching our customers that this is the way to go, and I think as an organization, we have to do the same ourselves. Good. As a global business service, we have not been the earliest one in jumping on the GPS journey. We have uh, only moved in 2016 and 17 from country shared service into global business services covering uh, functional hubs, HR, IS, and supply chain. And we have moved uh, about 1,200 jobs uh, into, our, into our five business centers, global business services, in a lift and shift approach, um, taking as is from a country, moving it to the business services. We still work with some front offices, but um, as you can see, uh, the, there is a, a mix and the, primarily the transactional activities in the hub. We are working especially as of 2018 on stabilization and starting with automation, and that's where RPA, of course, comes in very handy. Before we go into the automation, uh, there are different ways of automating. I focus here on the robotic process automation. We see on the left-hand side the very simple macros that you're probably very familiar with in so many years. Excel macro is one of them. But then on maybe the, the right-hand side, when it comes to machine learning or uh, autonomous intelligence, this is uh, something else not covered necessarily here. Um, however, RPA is also used on intelligent automation, combining, let's say, the orchestration of work using artificial intelligence engines. The skill set of a robot or the RPA skill set, you can see here on the left-hand side, uh, relatively simple. Um, a robot will mimic all the work that a, a user can do on a, on a PC. It can read structured data. So if you read an image, it still needs OCR before to recognize the image into characters. 
but otherwise it can read everything, it can jump across application, it uh, can work, it can use Excel a lot to store temporary information or use it to compare information. And uh, it doesn't have intelligence itself, it uses some script logic or logic that you build in into the process. Um, the comic on the right hand side would be fully explaining it right. Uh, actually someone looking for a dull and repetitive job, that's a robot. On the other hand, the robot does it very well. It does it without mistakes, uh, it is 24-7 available, and um, it is, uh, let's say, no attrition. And what we have learned throughout this journey also, actually it motivates employees because it removes the most boring repetitive task. Our journey um, started already in 2016. Um, we were in the midst of transferring activities from the various country to the GBS, but we wanted to kind of start to get a feeling how does RPA work. So we could read a lot in the press, and that's why we were glad to be able to get some seed money to do a proof of concept. We did this in accounts payable because that's my area, and it's repetitive, very repetitive. And um, from this point of view, we kind of had, in a relatively short period of less than three months, we got a script ready for a bot that is uh, ready uh, doing some work. It was, of course, done in the test environment or in a, in a special environment. And everyone that has familiarity with uh, these processes, especially in accounts payable, um, you need to create uh, purchase orders and you need to then have uh, invoices fed in, and then no surprise, it works well. And that's why I said, let's try to see if that works in production as well. Because what I wanted to feel or get the feeling is, how does the robot react if there are like thousands of invoices coming in, they are not exactly maybe as planned, doesn't cover all the, all the cases, and how is the robot then reacting? And it was doing well, so that we clearly kind of were excited to go ahead we looked for other opportunities outside of accounts payable as well, what process makes sense, and then uh, build the business case for this. We had it then approval, took also a little bit longer, but that's more the corporate way of, of getting some of these things uh, done. It didn't necessarily help that we had a CFO change in, in the middle, but um, we were then good to go for an RFP, and we did that in collaboration with our colleagues from IS, from HR, and supply chain. Typically this takes much longer when you do it cross-functional. You get a lot of people all have their opinion and trying to find a conclusion is sometimes not very easy. However, it has the big benefit that we all now are standing behind this. We are using the same platform and we are um, actually, let's say, not going our own journey and, and trying to do automation in many different ways. We then had uh, governance and IS setup of the infrastructure that was relatively, let's say, time consuming. But our head of operation, he wanted to get a Christmas bot, basically said in uh, November, I want to have a, a bot by Christmas. And so we did that uh, on a desktop version while the environment is being set up. You can see in one of the photos, we definitely have uh, achieved that goal. And um, we had uh, our first let's say, bot life in operation. Then it continued during last year, uh, building 19 bots in Krakow and Bangalore, our two global hubs. Um, we had internal audit doing a special RPA audit, uh, looking at the environment, the governance, and the project execution. Uh, while in Bangalore, we introduced the RPA lab, and uh, in Krakow, we built the, uh, starting with the COE. Good. Now, in case you started to kind of wonder, you hadn't had the opportunity, how does a bot actually look? I have a short video where you just see uh, two scripts in action. Um, it goes maybe a little bit faster than the reality because during some waiting periods that would be more boring um, and therefore um, maybe the real bot is not as fast, but it gives you a little bit an impression of, of what the bot does when it kind of shows on the display what is, is being performed. We can. Go ahead and play the video. So 
you see that it goes into um, SAP, it uses Excel, it goes into our internal netting application, extracting data, copying it over, comparing it, kind of relatively dull activities, but very nice if this is done automated and in a very good quality. The same on the next one, it's about account reconciliation, taking out data and storing that in our account reconciliation tool, doing all the necessary entry comparison. The employees only need to be involved if there is an exception somewhere, allowing us to store data very nicely and neat for the auditors, um, having the reconciliation done and the speed, let's say, for the employees is to focus only where there is maybe some uh, human brain needed to do some investigation. So that was giving a little uh, feeling of how does it look actually, how is these, are these scripts uh, performed. We are doing it on a server-based uh, environment using, um, let's say, these are being run so nobody will be seeing a screen popping up here and there. But if we want to record it to get a feeling, then uh, we had to do this specifically. We're using Blue Prism and um, kind of in, in this uh, way we had uh, kind of running all the bots and can orchestrate them whenever uh, we need to have them timed or when we need to have them run after a special uh, task has been executed. So at the moment we have 19 bots uh, delivered in phase one. You see uh, which bots are done work. So a lot is invoice processing or intergroup uploading, IG reporting. Um, on the other hand, we had um, also now lined up what is coming for the next half of this year. There are more global processes. In the first, uh, let's say, phase, we looked a lot of opportunistic, opportunistic RPA, looking at where do we have good savings of activities that we could actually give to a bot. We did that um, on country processes because we still work a lot with country ERPs. But now we go more into global uh, processes. We had also a little bit more time to do the standardization of some of the processes and align them so that we, we can leverage now on global bots. The way we evaluate processes of what is actually good for RPA, um, we use this general consideration. First is, as said earlier, standardization. How standardized is the process? Um, it's always better to have standardization first, but if you want to standardize the whole world before you start with RPA, you probably don't have enough resources that you can use to actually do this. So there needs to be always uh, an offsetting. Where do we use tactical in order to free up resources that help us on doing the standardization? And where do we do then the standard which we actually like to, to keep and to perform in a well manner? The repetitiveness, the next one, how repetitive is it and how many exceptions, then clearly transactional in nature um, and uh, complexity, how many system, how many decision trees, um, how many variations, kind of all helping to see is it an easy bot, is it a complex one, um, human interaction, how many times in the part needs a human to come in. Um, is it something that the bot can do a lot in itself or is there a ping pong back and forth which may make it not as suitable? And then of course, um, how much automation has already been done or is there even a better way to automate that? Just having RPA to do everything is not the best idea. There are probably like system automation that, that still make more sense and RPA is more, uh, let's say, your ability that if system automation is not possible for whatever reason or timeline, 
that you are able to actually still automate something if this is uh, giving a, a, a bigger benefit. Now on the evaluation process itself uh, to continue, um, we have a short list of, of ideas. What do we want? What fits actually to the evaluation criteria we just saw before? And then it needs to go a little bit in more detail, um, you know, looking at the metrics, the frequencies, the timing, etc. looking on the process flow chart you see below, which process can be done by a bot, which one needs a human. Um, and not everything needs to be done by a bot. There can be a nice jump back and forward. We may need to have then a ticketing system where we can uh, hand over nicely the task from a bot to a human. Uh, so this goes along the way to kind of get the feeling of what is the benefit uh, when it comes to effort and uh, return. And then we have a governance uh, approval process so that only the ones that we feel, at least for me in the P2P area that I approve as going into for a bot, will be then developed and put into the RPA environment. So what are the learnings so far that we had on the journey? And I group them in three different categories. One, the IS, then on the governance, and one on the people and the return on investment. On the IS side itself, I think it's important that uh, there is some awareness of the IS uh, on that technology because it's, I call it here, unusual automation. The reason for this is you can automate something which without IS to know. You, because you just need a user ID, which typically you can apply for, and then you have a normal user ID, and you can actually use a robot to do, do automation on a system which IS is not aware of. So in order to avoid this and to have a lot of questions and people not understanding it, it's very important that they are on board and understand this. They also don't delay, uh, let's say, the process, but um, kind of help and, and make sure that whenever there is a maintenance on such application that the RPA uh, monitoring team is aware of. Then uh, the methodology, um, very often if you use a typical IS, um, let's say ERP automation methodology, that's quite heavy and maybe overkill for RPA because typically in two, three months you should be able to put in a bot. If you then make it nine months, we start to, to really go too far. Um, on audit issues raised, uh, some of them is SOD, segregation of duties in the RPA environment. Um, comes to who does what, how fast do we want to be, also about production documentation and authorization. These are more like um, kind of getting speed and traction, but we need to make sure we, we kind of maybe have better handovers of who can do what. Um, naming convention, a very simple one, because in your uh, control room on the RPA, you will have a lot of bots, a lot of scripts. If there is kind of wild naming, that makes it very difficult later on when you have a, a large number of scripts. And then user access, user handling, this is a, a very big topic. Uh, one of it, for example, is on the IS policy. We just had two types of users in our IS policy. One is the system users, one is the end user. But RPA needs something in between because RPA is not a final user, but it still needs a, a logon page because that is typically not available for the system user. So Thomas, also some others. Yep. Uh, we have a question uh, which I just wondered if we, if you wouldn't mind taking now, which is uh, uh, how long in average, uh, on average, uh, is there between the RPA idea, so the kind of process you went through when you identify it, and putting the bot into production? So uh, actually, kind of uh, working on a day-to-day -day basis is, is a question we've had in from yeah. uh, one of the uh, one of our guests today. Yeah, I would say three months is a good one, but you could see, for example, for our Christmas bot or, or another one we had, uh, we put it in four weeks as well. Okay. But typically three months is, is, a, is a probably a, a good rule of thumb. Three months, okay. And then okay. it depends, of course, on the complexity, but typically um, you can do it relatively fast, um, and then you still need to make sure that all the documentation, everything is there, uh, because you probably remember also some of the wild Excel macros that you may have in your organization that mm -hmm. somebody did, nobody knows exactly. We have to make sure that we don't have some of these bots in place which have been quickly developed, maybe not enough uh, documented, and I think it's um, a good range, three okay. months. Yeah, yeah, good. 
Uh, so ho hopefully that answers the governance. your question. Um, yeah. So, so could I just ask, uh, just uh, do you name all the bots like Christmas bot and Easter bot and then the World Cup bot, or is it just just the one that's the, the for Christmas? Uh, I mean, this is the <laughs> two pilots that the name okay. on the public holiday, but then I think they they even call them names. So I have a Thomas bot oh, as well. <laughs> yes. So we just because have... HR, we need a user name ah. for setting up user uh, like the Active Directory. So they need to give a name, and that's where they kind of give some names there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, d just before we start on governance, uh, we have one other question, and if that's okay, um, do you apply uh, the normal IT controls like access controls and change management controls to the bots? So they they have the controls that a kind of typical employee would have. I think is the question we have here. Yes. Uh, now I would say it's it's a normal. You need to have it documented and uh, processed, but I would say it's still a little bit simplified. Mm -hmm. um, and on the users, we're still going to be uh, reviewing the user IDs on a, let's say, quarterly basis mm -hmm. um, and make sure that the, the still the user is, is there. Uh, and uh, passwords need to be also changed on a quarterly basis. That's kind of the rule our IS department has given. It was initially on 12 months, but they felt uh, after the audit we should be looking for three months. We built as part of the script also a way that the robot changes the user password uh, uh, itself let's say going in and make a change on the password so nobody knows actually what it is um, but then if it uh, so it needs to be done the bot is running this script on a on a let's say frequency that changes the user mm -hmm. password yeah yeah no, that's fantastic thank you Good. Oh, thank you for that on the so, governance, governance yeah. um, very quickly it's important that we don't have Wild West implementation because, again, as soon as people start to get excited, you will get a lot of ideas. Um, and we need to make sure that um, we have a process or a governance in place to make sure that the, that the right uh, bot is applied, not something which is a bad process, because that's not the next point. Bad processes we can very simply automate as well, but this is not the best uh, automation idea. Or processes we don't feel like it are are kind of uh, the way we would like to handle this in the future. Um, as well as pain point versus benefits, I had a couple of uh, requests on KPI reports because it seemed to be quite a pain for uh, the people to do this at month's end. But sorry, even if it's a pain, it's a one time, maybe four hour benefit versus something I can as savings of multiple times a day. It just uh, doesn't justify uh, uh, to build a bot for some of these pain points. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the decision about which to standardize first and automate uh, or where to use tactical RPA. And we have used, especially in phase one, tactical RPA. And I think this is nice when you need to run a GBS, when you need to drive, drive productivity and you want to free up uh, resources that can actually be leveraged uh, for driving standardization. And then on people on ROI, again, people worry at the beginning and they have been um, – buried in both places. We've implemented them so far. And then it was um, actually very good because with attrition, you can deal with the, let's say, nobody needs to be laid off. In the GPS hubs, we have enough attrition that can do this in a, in a good way. And the people then started very quickly uh, to get excited because they see the benefit of the bot taking away some of the most boring work and they have the possibility to do the more interesting one. On the recruiting also, we need the right skill set of people which are uh, special on the process but have a little IT understanding because in, in some of the bots that we haven't gotten the rest a good uh, return uh, was that uh, some of the missing pieces uh, have been, let's say, in the design of it not considered. And um, then we had too many exceptions the bot couldn't perform. So there needs to be some kind of mixed skill set uh, in between. Also, FT savings, uh, I see now when I look at what was initially planned, what's the reality, it's, um, it's a, a little bit less than what we originally planned. Uh, there are also exceptions, of course. And then typically um, an ROI is not um, three to six months, which maybe some of them will tell you uh, it's more around 12 months, but this depends also where you implement it. Um, if you implement it in a, in a low-cost uh, country uh, where TGBS typically is located, 
it will take longer because of course you replace the lowest employee skills um, and not kind of like senior management uh, on the local level. And there are a lot of extra benefits um, beyond the savings because I think especially um, on, on the quality side, I think this is very helpful, um, avoiding some of the errors. Now I speed up because I don't want to make go uh, way too far now. Um, very quickly, looking in the future, there are already scripts in place that I've seen, not in our place, but with uh, our service provider, where they mix RPA and, and AI. Very interesting. I look forward until we can join into this, looking, for example, if about contractual compliance, let's say volume discounts, etc., or fraud protection. So there is the journey continuing, and RPA is, is uh, many times used as orchestrating this, um, working with the engines. So it is definitely not stopping here. About the game changer, we have seen, and Chris has said that as well, we have been worried so long about robots, and I looked when I searched a little bit around, like even in the you know 1940s, they were already worried about this. And I think we've seen that over and over that uh, it is not uh, yet justified that uh, this is really killing the jobs. Because what we do usually, we just upgrade all our jobs. We upgrade the services we are able to deliver. So for me, at this stage, I see RPA as a very nice way to enhance. And we still want to just kind of deliver better services to our business, do it more efficient and cheaper and uh, are able to, to pass the price uh, uh, to our customers, the price benefit. Now, is it a game changer? Can it reduce 30% of the cost or more? I would say when you learn from the industrial robot sector, um, a game changer, it's just a way of how, how we start to produce it differently. In the industry, that's now unthinkable, not having robots. I would say in the GPS environment, they will be the same uh, very soon. We will have work with robots alongside um, either by using an outsourcer, this is typically done that your your BPO is using them, or if you're large enough or if, if it becomes even uh, cheaper that you can run them on your own uh, sooner or later. Um, so it doesn't disrupt the business uh, because I think again if you have it today or not, it doesn't make a big change that you uh, will lose market share, etc. And on the cost saving, 30% or more, no, I would say we are more by between the 15 and 20%. Um, still a lot of benefits, especially in a GPS environment, allows you to uh, uh, be a little bit, let's say, freer from the IT department because you can uh, use also tactical RPA where, for example, the, the best system automation is not working or where you don't get the priority that you need, but you still can deliver where necessary. But um, Again, you can maybe get 30% of the cost out when you start to apply them in high cost country, maybe in business operations, that is definitely possible. So overall, I think it's the normal way that we start to perform. Um, it's exciting, uh, as said, a lot of colleagues uh, along the way have gotten a lot of excitement. And I think sooner or later, if you haven't done this already, you will be uh, applying this as well. And Otherwise, your outsourcer definitely does it already today. So this kind of was now a little bit in a rush going through. Um, as you may or hopefully have heard, I feel this is an exciting topic. I have had a, a great pleasure to see these bots coming in action, and I think the idea catalog is going way up. Um, we have so many good ideas. The problem is how do we get these all in, especially when we think about going up the value chain looking for benefits for our business users, um, stuff we have never tried to do because it would be just too costly. Now if we think about the bot option, we can now start to think about doing it. Thomas, thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, as your slide says, we'll move to uh, the, the Q&A now just for a few minutes. Uh, that was a fascinating insight about uh, how you've gone uh, along the journey of digitization within ABB. Uh, hopefully, you're happy just to take a few questions. Um, the, the first, if, if you don't mind me asking, um, is really about how did you begin that journey? Was it something that was a top-down from the CFO? Was it bottom-up from yourself and your colleagues? Uh, or was it actually a combination of both? How, how did this uh, journey start back, I think it was in 2016, in terms of actually the catalyst 
uh, to actually bring about the, the start of that digital journey? Well, I think it was more like conferences like this or, or discussions from consultants that you could see or, or read in the internet about uh, RPA that uh, was kind of getting the curiosity up and the, um, trying to say, can we use this as well? We are now teaching a lot of people in our transfer from the countries to the hubs. We're teaching them the work, but there is work that we could actually teach a bot instead. Mm -hmm. So that was the starting point, so bottom up. And then we had management, which was very open to say, you get some seed money that you can test it out. And I think right. this combination was helpful along the way. Yes. Now, just on that point, actually, we've had a question that's come in which says, uh, how do you share the value with the BPO? So I assume this is the, the, the outsource provider, the uh, business process outsourcer. How, how do you come to an arrangement about sharing that? Because you mentioned that they were part of the reason for the catalyst of starting this. Do you share some of the value with them? Um, now, we are captive centers. So right. we use just the, uh, a BPO or like a service provider that helps us build the uh, RPA environment. So we okay. have a, a typical setup that we say, you help us build, maintain, and then transfer it uh, over to our COE. But um, we, in this case, keep it all for us. But if you have a service provider BPO, need to make sure that you have this contractually agreed with the productivity saving and then leave the saving to the BPO how they achieve that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's uh, understood. Now, just uh, another question we've got in uh, amongst many, but uh, just what this one, I'll pick this one out actually because it's very interesting. It focuses on the people uh, about how you dealt with the transition of that. Did you provide training? Um, and, um, you know, the, the person who asked this question says is, there's a concern about the employees, about whether or not they may be resistant to learning these new skills. D did you find any resistance and how did you? handle and train your people? Uh, no, I think uh, we didn't have that, but that is potentially like when you work in, in many of these centers, um, we have very young employees coming in, graduates from the universities. They are eager to learn more. And what we do is we take the most boring jobs away and, and, and use them. Or we do uh, during the closing, we do some nightly tasks which the, the bot is preparing for them and making their life easier. So I think there was no e no difficulty at all. And if, if one of the activities basically has reduced a job somewhere else, they have been moving to another one. And in a, in a GPS environment, this is anyway what the young people want. You cannot keep somebody too long in accounts payable on invoice processing. They will be glad if they cannot maybe go into um, another activity in the GPS. So from this, no problem. I think what was important is that we had a very clear message from the beginning that there will be no, let's say, redundancies due to RPA, because we have, uh, and, and I think this is, uh, at least in some of these two centers, Krakow and Bangalore, are quite usual, with about 25% attrition, you can go quite long, and you don't need to, to really lay off people because of RPA. Yeah, yeah. Now, just one, one final question before we close, if that's okay, Thomas. Uh, the question is, what is the reason for developing both in Krakow and Bangalore, and not just one Global Business Center. Why did you choose to do it in both rather than just focusing maybe on one one of those uh, as a center of excellence? Um, yeah, I think what we've seen is, um, first of all, our service provider is um, based in India. So that was clear that they were working very close then with our colleagues in, in Bangalore. And we said we need the COE and we need to, to have them close, sitting close with our uh, a team that is on the floor. And if you have a GBS center that has uh, 2,000 people, it's actually good to have them close by so that the link between the SME doing the work plus the person that can help on, on building the case for, for the RPA and, and going into the, the work pro project mode is close by same floor. So from this point of view, that was a benefit for us. If you ask, uh, do we do this in the other hubs? We probably have one or two SMEs there that is just the bridge between technical and uh, and the people doing the SMEs. Uh, so from this point of view, I think, um, yes, it was a benefit for us to do it this way. Uh, if you do everything remote, it's a little bit more difficult. Yeah, fantastic. So thank you, and, 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 and thank you very much indeed for sharing today about the way that uh, you've dealt with this. You know, I think it, 
ABB has a fantastic reputation, and I think the way that you've started your general, your digital journey really kind of shows uh, uh, how ABB is doing that. So thank you again, Thomas, for, for uh, sharing that with us today. Uh, just a, a couple of points to finish. So uh, you may be aware the conference board has a number of kind of peer networks around uh, uh, finance. So you can see that we have uh, three in particular here. I would encourage you to find out more about those, even, even join them. Uh, we have a, a webcast uh, program that's going on. So if you found today very useful, uh, then you might want to join uh, some of those in, uh, in the future. Uh, and uh, of course, our uh, webcast evaluation. Um, so we really appreciate your feedback. Hopefully you found today uh, useful uh, and commercially insightful about what you're going to do in your own business, which is the critical thing uh, we want to do here. Um, so uh, please uh, fill that in. Uh, and just uh, finally from me, I think one of the things that I want to take away from this, we, we talked about at the beginning about robots stealing the jobs. One of the things that I hear again and again from people in uh, our council members at conference board is that we can't find enough high quality people. And one of the things that Thomas has talked to us about today really is that uh, RPAs and other digital technologies offer in finance a way of basically taking away the transactional, taking away the dull and repetitive and allowing the people really to kind of focus on the interesting and progressive areas of uh, uh, finance. So that's something where it's not really kind of stealing jobs, it's actually kind of retaining people, retraining them and allowing them to add value as well as you know, uh, mechanizing and getting the best of efficiencies from RPA. So hopefully you found that useful today. Thank you for joining us uh, from the conference board and hopefully you'll uh, join us again soon. Bye for now. Thank you.